everybody, and welcome to an hour with Kristen Higgins on Continual, the con that never ends. I'm Jean Adams, your host, and tonight we have the absolutely fabulous Kristen Higgins, and we're going to talk books and work and life and just have a great time. So welcome to Continual. Thank you, Jeannie. So nice to see your face. Yeah, I know, it's great. And <laughs> Zoom has <laughs> saved my sanity. <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> so you started out in the same place I did, which is in the romance genre with the fabulous and ever popular RWA. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you get your start? What made you start writing romance? Uh, well, let's see. It's going back in time these many <laughs> decades. Um, <clears throat> I'll say that my, my kids were tiny. Uh, my daughter was in kindergarten. My son was in nursery school. And I had left my job at this really wonderful advertising agency. I absolutely loved working there. Job was so much fun. And I always assumed that, you know, once the kids were in school, I would go back to advertising. But as the uh, years of being a stay-at-home mom went on, I realized how much I loved it. And, you know, I wanted to I never wanted to be rushing home to get to my kids. Um, and yet uh, my husband was carrying all of the family finances at that time. So I thought, well, I'm going to have to do something to contribute to the, to the finances. And um, I, I don't have a lot of life skills. I can take care of children. So if you're ever flying on an airplane and your baby is fussy, look for me. <laughs> um, I can bake cookies and I can bartend and that's about it, you know? And then I thought, you know, all my life I've loved romance novels and I've always, you know, even the bad ones I loved because I would rewrite the ending or extend a chapter or, you know, do something different with the secondary characters. And I thought, you know, maybe I could write a book because I've read thousands, right? So how hard could it be? <laughs> um, so notice, um, notice that we're both laughing hysterically. At that. <laughs> yes, yes, lol. Um, so I went to, I, I decided I would write a historical romance. I'm married to an Irishman. And I, one of the things that I, I thought at the times I loved, I love historical romance and historical fiction. And I thought, you know, so that's that's what I'll write. But what I want is um, a lot of conflict between the hero and heroine. I don't want it to just be a misunderstanding or, you know, she's so perfect and he's so perfect and they just have to meet. I wanted it to be very dramatic. So I thought, I'm going to set my book in Ireland in the potato famine. <laughs> um, and she'll be Catholic and Irish and he'll be Protestant and Irish and you know, there's a lot of conflict there. Oh so yeah, that's just there. built in. <laughs> it's a potato famine, um, you know, so romantic. <laughs> <laughs> Her brother's in prison for IRA activity, um, you know, and uh, and so I, I had this whole dramatic, like basically a giant soap opera set in Ireland during the potato famine, po-fam romance, we call it. And uh and it's a I, hot topic. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, forget like, you know, Bridgerton, just go for Pofam and uh, <laughs> a, little, a little darker, fewer nice clothes. Slightly like, darker. But, um, so I went to this writers conference, the New England uh, chapter of Romance Writers of America, and I was ready to like pitch my book and have a bidding war ensue over an outline, I might say. I hadn't finished the book. I didn't know you had to do that. Um, and I quickly realized that the market for potato famine, Irish, Catholic, Irish, Protestant romances was non-existent. Um, that in fact, I had probably made up that genre being the only author who was willing to go there, right? And, um, and I thought, yeah, okay, so not the potato famine romance. Let's try something else. Um, now at the time my son was three and so my daughter was six. And I thought, um, I need to write something that everybody can read and everyone can enjoy. So I'll write a romantic comedy. And since I, I know small towns and grow up, grew up in a small town, live in a small town, same small town I grew up in, um, I'll write a small town and a romance and um, 
you know, it'll be funny and it'll be in first person because that just appealed to me. And um, and I and I got to work. I remember coming home from that conference and saying to my husband, "The potato famine is out," <laughs> and I'm going to write a rom com. You know, <laughs> um, and he's like, "Oh my god, okay, all right." Um, so I wrote what I said I was going to write a small town romance about a regular person because that was an, another thing that I found lacking in the romance world at the time. So this is like early two thousands. I wanted regular people in my stories. I didn't want super wealthy, handsome, talented people. Um, I didn't want extraordinary circumstances. I wanted people like me and my sister and my friends, you know, librarians and nurses and, and stay at home moms and um, people with regular jobs. So I, I wrote it and um, I had some friends rewrite it and then I sent it out for submission and um, and eventually got that first book published and uh, I have not been without a contract since then. Which so is super crazy. cool. It, it's crazy because, you know, it. I, I don't want to say that it was easy because writing is a very difficult job to have. And getting published is very difficult. You have to really thicken your skin, you know, like an iguana or an armadillo, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, but that first book was very well received. I had signed a two book deal and, um, and now we're 21 books later. Wow. Now, you know, is that, was that Fool's Rush In? Fool's Rush In was my first book. Now, for those of you watching, this is back in the days as I started out also, where Amazon was not as not, it was just beginning, it was just barely the seed of it. And self-publishing was considered vanity publishing. At well, that I don't even think there was self-publishing. Other than vanity press, no, not. There yeah, wasn't. Right. So yeah, you right. really had to go through the gatekeepers. This was not a, gosh, I think I'll go publish my book. This was, I got to get an agent and I got to pitch an editor and I've got to find someone who actually likes this concept and loves the potato famine. <laughs> so what was it like for you now, one of the things we used to talk about back in the dark ages of 2006 was what was it like for you when you got the call? How did you feel when you, we got that call from that editor that said, I want to buy your book. Well, the, the first call I got, um, you know, first I wanted an agent because I, I don't like the business end of just about anything. And um, it sounded dirty. I don't know. How did that come out dirty? <laughs> We're romance writers. We can say that stuff. And get away with. <laughs> I don't like the business aspects of, of publishing. And um, so I definitely knew that I wanted an agent. And so I, I thought, you know, I know I have a really, a really strong book here because it, it took me six months to write that first book and a year to revise it because I wanted it to be as good as Susan Elizabeth Phillips or um, Jennifer um, Cruzy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I believed in my product. And then I started sending out cover letters to agents saying, you know, this is a book about, here's two paragraphs describing it. Here's three paragraphs talking about me and my writing history and copywriting and all that stuff. And I sent my letter up to 20 agents and 18 of them rejected me and two, I'm still waiting to hear from, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, 21 books later, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and um, I remember um, uh, one of the, um, I was in at a conference and uh, I was at an agent panel and and um, someone asked a question of, of like, you know, can you describe what you mean by fresh new voice? And the agent said, like Kristen Higgins. And I stood up and I said, you rejected me. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean like Kristen Higgins? You know, kind of what a shut up. But um, it's a hard business, right? So you, if you don't have a compelling cover letter, then you're just going to get, you know, sent to the slush pile, if that. So after like a couple of months, I thought, you know, I still believe in the book, but I'm not getting through. I have to take a look at the process. 
And so I shortened my cover letter to be like six sentences long. And I didn't send out any synopsis and first three chapters the way they used to have you doing. I just said, if you're interested in seeing more, let me know. And then people started immediately wanting to see the book because I had a, a good, you know, one line description of it and one line description of myself. And, um, and so I sent it out to Maria Carvenas agency in Manhattan and within an hour or two, one of her associates wrote to me and said, I, I'd like to, I'd like to see the first three chapters. And then later that day, she said, send me the whole thing. And within six weeks, I had signed with Maria. Um, and, you know, so it was, it was amazing. I had an agent. I had this New York agent. And I remember going to the city the first time to see her and how terrifying that was. You know, her <laughs> offices are in Rockefeller Center and she represents Sandra Brown and, you know, like some of these really big names. And, um, you know, I was absolutely terrified her. I felt like a kid being called into the principal and she was <laughs> still my agent, you know, all these years later, 20 years later, I, I still have the same one and only agent. Um, so she sent out the book to be, um, you know, on submission and she thought like, oh, I'm going to sell this thing right away. And she was wrong. <laughs> Every publisher passed. Oh my. Except, except one. And there's a, a line in publishing, you only need one yes. That's right. And so I got a, a yes from, from Harlequin, um, from HQN Books. And, uh, and that was that, you know, I signed a two book deal and I thought like, oh my God, I have to write another one. This is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I earned enough to uh, pave our driveway. Sweet. <laughs> right. It's really, you know, I'm really contributing. Like, yeah. I know. <laughs> my sister, Jeannie, my sister said like, what are you going to do with your advance? Are you going to go to Paris or something? And I was like, oh no, <laughs> no, I'm going to pave the driveway. <laughs> you know, the, so it's like, and have to pay extra, but you know, my advance did not cover the paving of the driveway. Um, but it did set me off on this wonderful path where readers loved me. They talked about my books. I was a, what's called a sleeper hit, that mm -hmm. first book. And the second book um, was nominated for Romance Writers of America Rita Award. Which would have been Catch of the Day, right? That was Catch of the Day, yeah. yeah. And yeah. it won, you know, and- yeah. So Isn't that are. the most thrilling thing? I mean, they've done away with the Rita now. It's it's a thing of the past. And that was the one thing I never got to do was get nominated. It's, so it's, you know, Romance's biggest award. Wow. And, uh, and no one, like no three people in the room had heard of me and actually read the book. And there's 2000 people in the room. And yeah. it was such an out of body experience. And I remember like just floating up to the stage. It was the last category of the night. Everybody was tired. And <laughs> Um, and I gave a very funny acceptance speech because I, you know, I had no notes because I was with like seven of my favorite authors in that category. So I knew I wasn't going to win. So I didn't have a speech and just it, but it was, it was very, uh, popular. The speech was very popular. So people were coming <laughs> to me after like, I loved your speech. I'm like, oh, what did I say? I have no recollection. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, so that kind of um viral moment uh that sort of um enthusiasm from the crowd from from people who thought like well she's funny let me read her book um it it started the momentum that really carried my career to where it is now so i wrote romance for a while then i kind of morphed into women's fiction which is a, a denigration to both romance and women's fiction to think that romance is somehow not real fiction and that women's fiction doesn't have any um, relationships and romance in it, or for that matter, that any book doesn't have that. Right. Right. You know, but we are classified as romance writers and then possibly women's fiction. I, I recently said in an interview, um, you know, what is what is men's fiction? Is that like Playboy? You know, like. Yeah. We don't have a category for men's fiction. 
but for women's fiction we do and then my my latest book which will be my 21st is commercial fiction so it's just fiction I've you know in fiction <laughs> yeah so um I guess I've you know morphed through all that now so, which which of your books was first to sort of go all out and and start winning or winning not necessarily winning I guess or start making lists which one was the did you build momentum or was it with that second book the 2007 book uh, uh, catch of the day or was it the next one um I think the first time that you, you know like I never thought that I was going to hit one of the big lists I was just happy to be published I barely knew what the New York Times bestseller list was and um my my fourth book was called um too good to be true right. and yeah. and i remember um my uncle called me and he said um you're you're the number two best-selling book in the country and i said no <laughs> right pull the other one not. and he <laughs> said no and he sent me um a screenshot of something and it was ebooks and it was the number two best-selling ebook in the country. And number one was Shutter Island by Dennis Lehane. And number three was The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Oh, wow. And so I was in between, you know, these legends. And I thought, like, there's there's been a mistake, you know. <laughs> like, it, Surely it, not. It's been a mistake. Um, my next book hit the USA Today list and my book after that hit the New York Times list. I remember when my editor called me to say that I had hit the NYT, which is, you know, the brass ring for all of us writers. Right. It, yeah. it has magical math. Um, you, yes. know, you can sell a lot of books and not hit the New York Times list, um, yes. but it still has that panache. Of it does. New York Times. So she called me and um, I, hung up on her because of, <laughs> you know the she, someone's pranking me I'm like yeah okay fine bye and then she called me back like no Kristen it's really Tara and you're you're my new favorite New York Times bestseller and I was just silent <laughs> just but you know and um and she said we're sending you over like next week's list and so there it was the list at the time had 25 slots and my book was number 21. Oh. But there it was, you know, on the list, I printed it out and I ran over to my mother's house. <laughs> and I said like, mommy, look, look <laughs> I'm the bestseller. And she put it on the fridge like I was in kindergarten and made a cute drawing, you know. Uh, That's so, so awesome. It, it, was, <clears throat> it was amazing. And then um, for, for years thereafter, I, um, my mass market books were on the NYT. And it, it, I tell you, it does not get old. It doesn't matter that their math is wonky and the list is curated. USA Today and, and, um, and the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Publishers Weekly, like it's just so amazing. You know, it's so surreal and you never take it for granted. I don't know any author who does. Um, and, and most of us authors, we seem to be like insecure at some level, you know, like, well, I'm glad you liked this book because it's trash and I just tricked you into liking it, you know? <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever be able to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> right. I've been saying that since my second book, like nothing will ever be as good as the last book. Um, so, so that is, it's just so thrilling and so exciting. And, you know, when you get the call from your editor, you get the list and, and, you know, the whole team is cheering for you. It's really thrilling. And it's so much fun to tell my kids who grew up with me as an author, you know, um, and uh, my son is especially blase about it, you know, and one time he was in Target and there was a promotion on the, they had a big board you know big tv board and it was like hi i'm new york times best-selling author kristen higgins and he said very casually like oh that's my mom <laughs> and his friend was like your mom is an author you know? uh, i didn't mention that you know? <laughs> um but um but i love i love to tell the kids like you know oh mommy got a starred review or or uh hit a bestseller list you know that's real yeah. 
that never gets old. <laughs> and you know, it's it's the reward for ten months of slogging through a book that you think you cannot be saved was a horrible idea that you never should have started. Yeah. So that's my process anyway. <laughs> Well, I think one of the things that you uh, do so brilliantly is you make your characters very three-dimensional and very relatable. It's like you said at the beginning of the interview, they're, they're people that you know. They're people that you sit next to on the bus or sit next to, they're in the next office or they work at the bank or they're people you run into in your everyday life and are so relatable that I think all of us who read your books go, yeah, that. I, I could either be that, or I know that, or I've lived that, or, you know, and especially in a small town, you know, small towns are such peculiar animals in that you, everybody knows everybody's business, but there are so many secrets that nobody knows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I mean, so it's, it's super fun, both as a reader and a writer, but as a reader of your books to explore that town with you, especially the Blue Heron series where you get yeah all these different family members and the way things interplay and the way, like I said, everybody thinks they know everybody. And then right. they don't. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love writing families um, and as an extension, the town that the family lives in. And as I said earlier in the interview, I grew up in a small town, you know, where you did know everyone in your class and, and their parents by sight, you know, and you'd walk into the post office and, and people know you and comment on, you know, oh, sorry about your grandfather or something like that. You know, you have no secrets except for your secrets, right? You know, right. Um, and, uh, but I also love the aspect of family where two people can grow up with the same parents in the same house at the same time and have completely different experiences of the family and of relationships. And the Blue Heron is the, the, the one true series that I, that I have written and it's five books. Um, and it, it was based around the Holland family in upstate New York in the Finger Lakes region. Uh, and the Holland family owns a, a vineyard called Blue Heron. And um, the first character in the story is the youngest sister who comes back to town. You know, that old saying, there's only two plots in a world, someone leaves town or someone comes to town. <laughs> so, so Faith comes to town and, uh, you know, we experience the, the Holland family and, and the town, the fictional town of Manningsport through her eyes as someone who grew up there as a rather privileged kid, but had suffered a tragedy in the loss of her mother in a car accident during which she was in the car. The guilt that she carries about that, um, the reparation that she thinks she has to make and the way she sees her other family members. And then the next story is her sister who has come across one way in book one, but is suddenly much more three-dimensional in book two. You know, when you see hey, this Absolutely. Is the daughter who never left, the daughter who stayed, you know, the daughter who's closer to the father than the mother um, and um, how she sees her younger sister and um, I just, I just love that. I think people are infinitely interesting, and yes. they all have a novel-worthy life and a period of their life where something dramatic happened that changed the course of their lives. Yeah. Um, so sometimes, sometimes that's choices, and sometimes that's circumstances. Right, right, and and. You know, I, I always say the best quality of a writer is to be a listener. Um, so, you know, to hear people, to, to, to really listen to that, you know, irritating great aunt who talks too much to get to know her and find out she has an utterly fascinating story. Or, the, you know, the, the, uh, one of my books was inspired by a woman sitting across from me on the train. Uh, I was coming back from a Yankees game. <laughs> and... Uh, she was on the phone with her boyfriend and begging him to explain why he had broken up with her when they had been so happy and she just didn't understand. And I, I you know, it was those seats where you're facing each other. Yeah. And I was saying like, hang up, honey, hang up. You know, and I was handing her tissues because I'm the kind of mom who always has tissues in my bag. Yes, <laughs> and just telling her to hang up, you know, he's not worth it. And, you know, and, but I just thought like, you know, Imagine being so, so 
heartbroken that you don't mind bearing your secrets in front of a carriage full of people on Metro North. You know, um, you're just so heartbroken. It's so important in that moment, you know, and, and all you would do anything to have him take you back. And, you know, I've been that girl and I'm glad not to be that woman. <laughs> <Yeah. know? laughs> um, but uh, she inspired a book, you know, I just yeah. thought, imagine what, what led up to that moment, what went so wrong. Um, so I love to, I love to talk to people. Um, yeah. My kids always joke that, you know, I can't get on an airplane without leaving with a best friend and, um, <laughs> you know. My, my daughter said recently, like, you don't have to be so nice to everybody. I'm like, what? <laughs> Who raised you? Of course I do. <laughs> and by the way, I think, I think one of the things that people appreciate and love about your book so much too, is not only that kind of relatability, but you always seem to use a pet or a, a family sort of creature in yeah. your books that, and, and I think people relate really well to that too. Yeah. It's, is there so, I mean, obviously you have pets. I, my cat is lying on my lap right now. Um, and my dog is downstairs waiting for me to sit in the chair so he can join me. He just stares <laughs> at my easy chair waiting for me to get in it because he can only <laughs> sit in it with me. Um, yeah, you know, I, again, like write what you know. I am an animal lover. Um, I am, uh, I love children. Um, again, my kid's nickname for me is creepy baby lady because I can't <laughs> stop. I can't not stop at a carriage and say like, Oh, look at your baby. He's so beautiful. You know? Um, but the pet aspect to me, it, it seems like a gimmick and some, and you know, for some writers it might be. Um, but for me, the, the pet you choose and, and the way you treat your pet reflects a lot about your personality and character. So I don't just gratuitously stick a dog in I, I mostly have dogs. I think I've had a few cats, but in addition to dogs. Um, and uh, it, it says it says something about, about what you were drawn to. Was it the big, goofy, lovable dog? Or was it the shy, abused dog who wouldn't let anyone pet her? Um, in, um, in my book, Pack Up the Moon, my most recent book, um, they the couple has a dog that they get as a puppy and um and lauren there's no secret lauren in this book has a terminal disease and and when she dies she kind of leaves her dog with her husband um and he resents that dog for outliving his wife you know and and you know just doesn't really have the kind of bond with the dog that she had and you know throughout the book that that's emblematic of his state of mind, his emotional state, his challenges of being on the spectrum. Um, so it's very cho very carefully chosen, Jeannie. You know, it's not just like, oh, what dog is cute this year? Let me stick that dog in my book, you right. know? Um, I think a, an animal relationship is one of um, mutual, unconditional love, you know? Uh, you, if you are a pet owner and your dog barfs up something you clean it up you know and uh if you have an old cat with seizures peeing on your bed you deal with it you know yeah. um because that pet gave you so much love and and so much uh, comfort that you don't mind doing all that you know you don't you don't look at it as a burden and um and if you do i mean that says something about you too i would never write the point of view of that person right right you know? um because i write about you know decent people <laughs> <laughs> but in your books the the pets become both a character in and of themselves and in, in many of the books but they also are frequently you know the companion upon the journey Right. that gives a lot of insight, like you said, into the emotions and cares of a person whose point of view we're in, or the, you know, sometimes, like you say, how the pet is viewed is how the person is viewed. Yeah. And it really is a wonderful foil, generally, for your characters as to see who they are. It's, a, it's a, just a wonderfully cool way of showing a different facet of your characters and I, I really I've always appreciated that about your books because the pets in them are integral to the stories 
but they're also integral in the sense of showing who these people really are right. and how and how their hearts work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for picking up on that. <laughs> and well, it's just a lovely thing that you do and, and it makes those people that much more three-dimensional mm -hmm. uh, when you see how they react and how they interact with not only their their own pets, if that's the person in the story, but if they're the person coming into the story, either the hero or the heroine, how they react to the right, to the right. pet. And you're like, oh, hmm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, now you were talking earlier a little bit about um, making friends on airplanes and, <laughs> and being the one that talks to everybody. And, and uh, I know you, you said your kids, uh, you don't have to be that friendly. <laughs> My husband says that to me in the grocery store. Can can we go now? <laughs> Don't talk to people. Um, you, with a friend, do a fabulous podcast, but it's called Crappy Friends. <laughs> yes, yes, um, that is a, a labor of love. My my friend, uh, one of my be very best friends, Joss Day, who is a fellow author, um, we became close we were always, you know, friendly since the day we met, but there was, I remember distinctly, there was a summer day when we both were talking on the phone and we confessed to each other that we had been in a bad friendship. And it was so, so intense and, and so relieving to hear that another woman was dumped by a female friend um, or was in a relationship with a problematic friend. And we started, it was really what made us go from being friendly acquaintances to friends and eventually best friends. Um, this, this confession of like, we'd had similar experiences where we thought we had a really good friend and, and we had put a lot into this friendship and then the friend turned on us and we were so stunned and so surprised and we started just talking about it. It, it kind of became almost like, you know, I, I don't wanna say obsession, but a, a topic we were both fascinated by this complex, intricate world of female friendships in which society tells us you are friends to the grave if you are a woman who has a woman friend. You are a steel magnolia. You are there through, through thick and thin. You know, your, your first friend from kindergarten is going to be your maid of honor, is going to be your child's godmother, is going to be there holding your hand when you slip away. And Whether that, it's good for you or not. <laughs> that's not necessarily true. You know, right. friendships end. Um, sometimes we give our time to friends who... Uh, are not going to reciprocate in kind. Uh, and, um, and sometimes we're just in a very bad place ourselves and we grow out of it. Right. And, you know, and sometimes we're the bad friend. Sometimes um, we're the uh, uncaring friend or the friend who's not picking up on cues. So, so Joss and I thought, you know, someone needs to talk about this because there are millions of books about romantic relationships, finding them, maintaining them, getting over them. But where are the books for women trying to get over their friends or trying to heal a relationship or just recognizing that I shouldn't be giving my time to this person. You know, she's right. really sucking the life out of me. Um, so we, very spontaneously started a podcast called Crappy Friends. And <laughs> um, we get a letter, generally a letter or two each week uh, that we focus on and we we read it on air and and talk about it. And we, we say like, what qualifies us to do this? Nothing, we have no credentials to our names. We are just two women who have had a lot of friends who maintain a lot of friends. Um, you know, I, I call Joss my best friend, but I would say I probably have five best friends, you know, right. and, um, and they're all very special, and important to me. And I'm also kind of person who puts a lot of time and care into friendships. Um, because I, you know, I, I think like we, we have this idea that our romantic partner will be everything to us, you know, and I, I hear the, the, the young kids today, my, my daughter included saying like, I'm going to marry my best friend. 
And I think you, you are in a sense, don't let your other friends fall to the wayside. You're right, going, you right. know, you need more than one person in your life. So I, <laughs> I put a high value on my female friendships and, um, which is not to say I don't value my male friends. It's just different. They're very, it's always different. Yeah. Those guys are, you know, like one of my, my oldest friends is, is a guy. We grew up next door to each other and we have to do nothing to maintain that friendship. The fact that like we, he hit me with a wiffle bat when I was 10 <laughs> has bonded us for life. You know? <laughs> and I still have the scar, man. <laughs> right. so we don't need to invest in that or nurture that or anything like that but women are different I think women yes. are different yes yes they are well it's a wonderful podcast in that it is again so much the thing that we all have experienced right and it's so relatable because and I I can totally see why people would send letters in because it's like I don't get it. Why someone I I've invested in this. I've done these things. I've been a good friend. Yeah. Why is this person not being a good friend back? Right. And, yeah. and you're right. There's not much exploration of that. And we, as women take that very seriously. Yeah. I mean, very hard. Joss and I have said like, you know, sometimes the loss of a friendship is more devastating than a loss of a romantic relationship yeah. because it's not expected. You just, right. you know, you think like, oh, I'll date a guy and it, it'll work out or not. But my friend from eighth grade is dumping me. I, you know, right. what do I right. do? Right. My whole world is falling apart. I, this was well, not the lexicon. I don't think any of us acknowledge the grief of that. Right. right. And, you know, we all have these griefs that we don't process the same way. It's understandable and it, expected mm -hmm. that you grieve a family member or a pet or you know and sometimes that family member we don't grieve nearly as much as we do the loss of that eighth grade best friend who suddenly turned on us yeah yeah and, and I think the confusion over that you know the but 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 we were in eighth grade together you know when you got your period for the first time I was there you know <laughs> and and you think like well, that was 40 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> well, or the friend that you've traveled with for years to conferences or whatever, and suddenly they're like, yeah, no, hmm. yeah. you're like, wait, what? <laughs> right, right. And, you know, I think because when I started as a writer, I remember um, going to my first big conference, uh, Romance Writers of America in Dallas, Texas. And I remember seeing like some of the, the grand dames of romance walking by and tossing out a hello hello you know and I thought like I dare not approach them you know um like for example Nora Roberts uh right. who, who is one of the most prolific authors in in history I think and an, an absolutely lovely person but totally. uh, yeah. also someone who will tell you to your face like look I don't need more friends yeah I got <laughs> friends, you know I'm done I got my and, posse. <laughs> um and I and I thought um, and I'm not talking specifically about Nora because I didn't know her then, but I just remember thinking like, I never want to be unapproachable. I never want to be like too successful to make friends with somebody in the elevator. Right. Um, and, and I mean that, you know, I'm, I'm sincere about that. And, and I, I know that I have a reputation for being very approachable and someone who will like give you advice or, or point you in the right direction if I can, you know, because I've been around now for a long time. But, um, but also what happened with that when I started meeting hundreds and then thousands of people a year was that I was, my attitude was sort of like, I will be friends with anyone. I'm not gonna be judgmental. I'm not going to be, you know, making anybody feel like they can't sit at this table. However, when it came to like the personal aspect of, of that, you start to realize like you get to be discerning. You can still be approachable, but you don't have to let everybody in and try to carry the expectations of their friendship. You know, you can mentor people, you can, you can, uh, be friendly with people, but you don't have to be everybody's best friend. So I think, you know, for me, what happened was there were, there was a period of years where I was best friends to, to way too many people, you know, and let people down and was let down. And I didn't vet my friends. We talk about that a lot on the podcast that, you know, you should vet somebody, you should, you should go slowly. Don't just say like, gosh, we had fun. Let's be best friends. Right. Uh, you know, <laughs> But women tend to do that, like, oh my gosh, we just had so much fun at that dinner 
and now we're going on a trip together. You know? yeah. Yeah. And she's my kid's godmother. And, you know, oops, now I find out she's, you know, not the person. A crazy I- woman. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been very rewarding. We also wrote uh, the book, The Crappy Friends, uh, Crappy Friends, the book. And, um, and that's been a, a real joy to get out in the world and have people read and like give to their nieces and stuff. We say it's like 127 years of therapy and one fun to read book. <laughs> Have several people who need that book <laughs> go ahead go ahead Jeannie you know? I'll be I'll be passing several of those out for the holidays yeah, yeah. <laughs> birthdays along the year in the calendar yeah <laughs> that's so great well and like we we said a few minutes ago that's not something that's frequently addressed and yet it's a huge part of our lives as women uh, and men have those kind of friendships too they have those kind of male bonding friendships that then suddenly they're like and I think that's been particularly so over the last few years where people have been like, do I even know you? Yeah. This is yeah. the whole thing that's going on. And so it's probably even more important that we take a look at those things with as much humor and good grace as we possibly can. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that's fabulous that you do that. And uh, the podcast is very successful. I know. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a lot of fun. It's one of those, you know, like we sat down at my kitchen table with a bottle of wine and a microphone and just like, how hard can this be? You know, (laughs) we listen to podcasts, we can do a podcast. So it's very homespun and down to earth. Um, We don't have an engineer or anything like that. We just, you know, we just do it uh, kind of at random, but you know, friendship, female friendship is a very important part of my books too. So it's like a natural link. Um, you know, you have, you have the, the uh, romantic relationship in, in most of my stories, if not all of them. And you also have, um, you know, the, the, the pet friendship, but you also have a, a friend, you know, whether it's a good friend or a bad friend, they're going to play a role in the story. And, right. uh, you know, and there's going to be a history of that friendship and sometimes the difficulties of that friendship, um, sometimes they'll be overcome and sometimes you think like maybe it's time I just step away yeah Uh, and uh one of the blue heron books has a particularly difficult friendship in it for honor and um and it was you know it was during a time when I was experiencing that that idea of like she would never have done that to me I saw her do it to a hundred people but you know like I'm special and that turns out no you're not (laughs) (laughs) So I I really enjoy exploring that kind of dynamic in my stories. In um, Pack Up the Moon, Lauren is has a a couple of friends uh, who are very important in the story, and um, you know one of them is her best friend from eighth grade, and one of them is her sister. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm very blessed to have the world's best sister, and. Uh, you know, I say to her, she, she's one of the great loves of my life. You know, the, my, my sis, my, she's 15 months younger. Um, we were treated basically like twins growing up, you know, same bedtime, same room, all that stuff. And um, it's just another, another family dynamic that you get to explore, whether it's good, bad, indifferent, growing into something better. Right. It's endlessly fascinating for me. Well, you really explored that a lot in terms of family and life and other inconveniences yes. uh, about families and the dynamics between generations and what led you to that? That book, um, it's funny, you know, you never know what will spark a book. I, I'm always under contract, so I always know I need to be writing another book or what will the next book be about? And um, my family and I went just for lunch one day to this beautiful town in Connecticut called Stonington, Connecticut. And it's on the, uh, the Atlantic coast. It's the last town before Rhode Island. And it's utterly beautiful and charming. And I saw a house and I thought, that's my next book is, is that house. Um, and How fun. I didn't know what, the story was going to be, but, you know, Connecticut is a wealthy state. That part of the state is especially wealthy, especially snooty, you know? (laughs) And so I thought I'm going to write about the owner of that house and how she has 
fucked up her family relationships. Um, for starting with her son going to her granddaughter, you know, and, and then becoming aware of her own mortality and thinking, I kind of want to make amends, but I don't want to admit that I did anything wrong either. So um, I, I really loved writing that book because it was tri-generational, you know. Yeah, yeah. And very highly acclaimed Thank and you. very good. So all yeah. of you can read it. It's wonderful. What, what, what brought you to uh, Always the Last to Know? Uh, Always the Last to Know is also set in that same town. Yeah. And um, I had a couple of friends who were going through a divorce at the time. And, um, and I wanted to write about marriage. Right. And my, my editor always says, what's your book about in one word? <laughs> <laughs> which is a horrible question and she should not be allowed to ask it no she like, should not <laughs> um, that's well, just mean <laughs> um, a journey uh you know a dog what you know I I always fish around but in this case I figured out this is a book about marriage and it's about a, a bad marriage but not like an abusive marriage just a right. tired marriage um an obligatory marriage, you know, where they're together because they just haven't really decided to divorce yet. Um, it's about uh, how much do you compromise on marriage? How much do you give up of your hopes and dreams for the future in order to be with the right person? Um, and it's, uh, it's about maintaining a happy marriage and the effort that goes into that and what you might think is important versus what's really important in that marriage. So it's the story of um, the three Frost women, the mother Barb and her two daughters, Juliet and Sadie, and how they have to come together when the father um, has a stroke and a pretty massive stroke. And Barb was just about to divorce him when he had a stroke. And now she's kind of stuck with this guy. And, um, I, I loved that book. I loved writing John's perspective from this, this man with a brain injury um, and the thoughts and memories that he had and, and what he didn't know had happened. You know, he, he, like he knew something was wrong, but he didn't understand why. And it, it felt very tender to write that book um, about these very imperfect people finding their way during a crisis and becoming closer because of it, not without bumps and scrapes, you know, I do like to write realistic books. Yes, you do. The heartache, <laughs> the heartache, but also the coming back into your own <clears throat> as the daughters experience both the mother as a, as a different person. Right. Because right. she's had to step up in this crisis and take charge and, and suddenly she's doing things that they've never seen her do. Right. And she, you know, again, like that idea of we both had the same mother, but we had very different mothers. Right. So Juliet is the firstborn and she has this mother who, you know, has, was so delighted and, and felt so lucky to be her mother. And, um, you know, everything was just wonderful from the pregnancy to the birth to this delightful child who excels in all areas. And then 12 years later, she gets pregnant again, thinking, you know, she would never have another baby, not wanting to have another baby because she was from a large family. She thought an only child would be the best thing to do. And then she has, you know, a horrible pregnancy and a very difficult labor. And then she has postpartum depression that goes undiagnosed. And she just doesn't bond with Sadie the way she did with Juliet, but she does her best. And so Sadie becomes daddy's girl. And so she yes. has this impression of her dad as like, he's the fun parent. He really gets me. He's, you know, he's so stifled by mom because mom is so, you know, this and that. Whereas Juliet thinks my mom is Wonder Woman. She does right. everything. She's, you know, she's my hero. And when they all have to come together with these different images of each other, it's really fun to see them bump and scrape and, and eventually figure things out for the better. Well, and to me, one of the fascinating things was the perception of, especially with the 12-year gap, <clears throat> the perception of one daughter of both parents and the other daughter of 
birth parents. I'm the youngest of four. So my perspective is completely different yeah. than my oldest brother's perspective. Yeah. First of all, there's gender. And yeah. second of all, 10 years. <laughs> well, you my, my uh, mom was pregnant when her baby brother was born. You know, she was 21 years older than he was. And she was you married a year and having a baby and her mother had just had a baby, you know? Um, my, my grandmother was pregnant at my mom's wedding. Um, and she was 42 having her ninth child, you know, she was 20 and she had my mom. Uh, so my, my youngest uncle and my mother had completely different parents, you know, being the oh, ninth yeah. child was easy. You know, if he was missing for three days, nobody even noticed. They were just <laughs> glad, you know, food to go around. <laughs> Um, whereas the older kids were under a lot of scrutiny and expectations and, and yeah. stuff like that. Well, and those of us who are the youngest generally do get away with more. It's yeah. true. Because I'm, if nothing, if for no other reason, then mom and dad are tired. <laughs> exactly. I know my grandparents were in their forties when, when my uncle was born, they were grandparents, you know, shortly thereafter. Um, and they had a toddler running around, you know, so yeah. it's crazy, yeah. but, um, but I think in this in this particular book, the perspective of the two daughters with this gap of time between them and their different experience of their parents and then having all of that turned on its head yeah. by the fathers having the stroke is a fascinating look at family dynamics. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it all, really about, I mean, it's all about, you can't escape where you came from and, and how you were raised for better, for worse. Right. And what you can do is reassess and think these are the things that have happened to me and shaped me what do i want to do now do right. i want to leave them behind and strike out on my own do i want to embrace them um do i want to reassess them and and see perhaps i was wrong about certain things so it, it just like i said you know every person has that story and and i want to tell them all <laughs> well you come to a new perspective and sort of a different place with Pack Up the Moon. Yeah. Because it starts with us already knowing that one of the characters who's majorly, a major portion of this book is not going to be with us at the end of the book. Yeah. 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 She dies in chapter one. Let's just get it out of the way. <laughs> Rip up the band aid. Um... Rip the band aid. Tell everybody. <laughs> so, you know, I. I'm a very emotional writer, you know, yes, and you are. <laughs> and did you, so okay. I just have to know, did you weep your way through writing chapter one? God, I was wrecked by this book, sobbing, you know, just like literally curling into fetal position some days and just thinking like, why am I doing this? Because as an author, you live the experience of your characters. And so this is a book about this wonderful golden couple who finds each other young and they get married and, and they're so lucky and in so many ways. And then they find out that Lauren has a terminal lung disease for which there is no cure. And she has years to live, but how many is kind of a roll of the dice. She knows that she will die from this disease unless there's a major medical breakthrough. And um, so, what do you do with that kind of prognosis? What do you focus on getting every minute of every day that you can possibly get? Or do you concentrate on the life you have now, this day, this week, this month? Um, and, and what do you do for your spouse? Because you're going to leave him, you're going to ruin him, you're going to die and break his heart. And that's the last thing you ever wanted to do. Right. Um, so it's such a difficult topic that I had to write about it. You know, I had to write this story because this is part of the human experience is loss. And we will all lose someone we love so much. How do you shape your life after that? How do you live with the unlivable, you know, the thing that, that, you would have died yourself to prevent. Um, and people do it every single day. So for me, this book is a story of a very happy marriage. It's a story of how to be happily married under 
this impending death and how to be happy in that time period, how to really live um, like you mean it. And, uh, and, and, you know, Lauren says in, in one of the opening lines, uh, I'm dying and this has been the happiest year of my life. And I wanted to explore how that could be. And, um, and then also show month by month how you get through loss, how you get through the devastating loss where you think, I, not only do I never expect to be happy again, I don't even know what happiness looks like at this point. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a foreign country at this moment. And what yeah, Lauren- that's the, that's the, I don't want to get out of bed stage. Yeah, yeah. But also just like, you know, the world is gray and dark and I don't see that changing anytime. I'm just a robot going through the motions. You know, I, I have, uh, I've not lost my spouse, thank goodness, but I lost uh, my dad in a very uh, tragic way. Um, when I was young and, uh, and I, I lost a baby. And um, so I know heartbreak. And I also know that you can incorporate that heartbreak and make your life better and bigger and um, not despite it, but because of it. Right, right. And, and that's the story I wanted to tell in Pack Up the Moon and, and to show how it's done because we all know it's done you know yeah. it, it, that people get through it and 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 do live great lives afterwards but how do you get there right I guess that's the question is how do yeah. you do it so this is the story of how it's done for this one couple oh that's excellent now i know you have a copy of the book there so maybe you could hold that up i will hold it up yes it's called pack up the moon and it comes out june 8th i believe yes right? yeah. june 8th Three days after my daughter gets married. <laughs> oh my word. <laughs> I, I said to my publisher, can we push it back a week? Is there anything we can do? And they're like, I'm so sorry. It's set. It's carved in stone. <laughs> really know? like to be participatory in this release, but not until then. <laughs> a little sleepy that first week. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an, uh, it's sort of a wonderful way to celebrate a new book too. You got a great new family member and a great yeah. new wedding and then a great book too coming yeah. out. Thank you. Yes. Well, this has been absolutely delightful. Uh, have thoroughly enjoyed talking with you about your books and your work and where you where are you going next? You always have a, a book in the pipeline, I know. I so yeah, my my next book is um is about motherhood, you know, that one word that my editor looks for is about um, mothering in all its different forms. And um, it's set on Cape Cod where my family and I have a, a, a home that I, you know, my dad bought when I was a little kid. And um, I'm very attached to Cape Cod. I spend as much time there as possible. And- I love uh, Cape Cod, love, love that place. Okay, my daughter's getting married up there too. So, Yay. so, nice. um, so um that's the book that right now I'm like, oh, it's a hot mess and I don't want anyone to see it and nothing will be as good as Pack Up the Moon. But next year at this time, I'll probably be singing a different song. There you go. <laughs> well, we will all look forward to that. Do you have a title for it yet? It's called Untitled at the moment, Jeannie. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> that is just such, so catchy. So catchy. <laughs> Well, again, thank you so, so much for being with us here on Continue. Why don't you tell everyone where we can find you on social media and your website and all that? Yes. Okay. My website is kristenhiggins.com and I'm on Facebook as Kristen Higgins Books and Twitter as Kristen Higgins and Instagram as Kristen Higgins. So it's Kristen with an A, but if you Google me under any spelling, I'm sure you'll find me. So absolutely well again thank you so much for joining us on continual and for all of you out there thank you for joining us as well thanks Jeannie <laughs>